Today I want to talk to you about rejoice and be glad. Somebody say it with me. Rejoice and be glad. Would you open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5? If I was to ask you, where is that passage found? Rejoice and be glad. Some of you might say it's probably after Jesus uh, took those bottles or barrels of water and turned them into wine. And Jesus looked at everybody and said, hey, y'all, rejoice and be glad the party is on. Some of you might, you all too uh, sanctified in church to laugh at that. That's okay. Um, but he said he gives wine to make the heart glad. But that's not where it's found. Some of you might say that that passage, rejoice and be glad, was found after he made all the fish you could eat. Anybody ever been to a fish fry before? I was just at one the other Friday. Oh, it was so good. But it wasn't there after he made all the fish and bread someone could eat. It wasn't after someone got healed that he said, it's a good day, you're healed, you're raised from the dead, or this thing has been cast out of you. Rejoice and be glad. Of course, they were supposed to rejoice. But what we'll see today is the context of rejoicing and being glad is found in the midst of persecution and people saying all kinds of evil against you. Are you with me? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, if you're there, can you say, I'm there? Thank you. Look at it. It says, blessed. Jesus talking here. Blessed are you when people take you out to lunch, when they buy you a new car, Oprah Winfrey style, you get a new car, you get one, you get, is that when you are just to be blessed? No, it says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Three things you are to count yourself blessed in. When they persecute you, that can be in taking of your job, taking of your property, even of your freedoms and life. I wear this bracelet to remind me of the underground church, the one who shared that testimony. We see that as online as well. It's validated. You can see the pictures of the 14-year-old who gave their life for Jesus. You can follow Open Door or persecution.org. And if you want a free bracelet, we give them out at the end of every service. I've been praying for the underground church uh, almost every single day at the time of our meals for almost 10 years. And I have been wearing this bracelet, not this one, because they break all the time for about the last five years. And so the Bible says that you can be persecuted and you're to be counted blessed. The first thing is insult you, to put you down. The second one is to persecute you. And the uh, third thing is to falsely say all kinds of evil against you. If you've had any of these three happen to you, and especially as of late, can I hear an amen in the house of God? If you've been blessed, can I hear an amen? You've been blessed if you've been insulted. See, we don't normally hear it like that, do we? Where we hear it the other way, you've been blessed when you get a new car. You've been blessed. No, but you've been blessed if you've been insulted because of Christ. You've been blessed if you've been persecuted. You've been blessed if they said all kinds of false things about you because of Jesus. Look at verse 12. Read it with me and say it out loud. One, two, three. Rejoice and be glad. One more time. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven, for this is the way, in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How many know the prophets were persecuted? They threw Jeremiah in a pit. Isaiah was hung upside down, legs split, and sawed asunder, sawed in two. How many know that's a bad day to be sawed in half? Other prophets were persecuted constantly on the run in fear of their lives, like Elijah during the time of, of uh, King Ahab and Jezebel, constantly in fear of his life. You look at some of the other prophets like Daniel. You don't get thrown into the lion's den because everybody likes you. Hello, can I hear an amen? You don't get thrown into the fiery furnace if you're one of his friends because everybody likes you. And these men were prophets. These men spoke the word of God. Women even suffering under the times of persecution. The Bible says that they were starved. They were neglected. They lost their property. They would have to run and hide in caves. The Bible teaches us that this is what happens in a world that hates our God. It's not that they hate you first. It's not personal against you. It's against your God. After all, when you were friends with them, they didn't hate you then. When you were doing what they were doing, they didn't come after you then. When you were talking like how they were talking, they didn't come after you then. It was only when you turned on the lights and exposed their darkness that they had to start insulting, persecuting, and saying false things against you. 
And even then the Bible says, forgive them for they know not what they do because they're being agents of Satan. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these principalities of darkness that have been set out to destroy us. Can I tell you a real story? Somebody say, tell it, Pastor. Now, it might scare you, freak you out, and make you think I'm weird. About a year ago, I was in my prayer closet, and I felt the Lord speak to me. Literally, I was in a closet in my room, and I felt the Lord speak to me. Do you want to address the principality over Chicago? I literally felt the Lord say that to me. I felt that that was crazy. Normally, my friends who talk like this, I think they're crazy. They're normally the, the, the granola Christian, fruit, nuts, and flakes. God's always telling them something, and normally it doesn't work out. How can I hear an amen if you know somebody like that? So I'm thinking, that's weird. I don't really know if I'm hearing from God. This could just be because I've been in the dark closet for a long time praying. I don't know what to do. So the Lord, obviously knowing my heart, was comforting me and said, no, this is me. And I'm speaking to you, and I want to know, do you want to speak to the principality? Because we believe that they have rank and structure. I believe that the Lord knew that we had been doing all this ministry up until this point, and we had not quite confronted him in a certain way. But I felt the Lord really convinced me that this was real. So I said, sure, I'll talk to the principality, get him on the phone. And I just felt like the Lord say, he can hear you now. And something just rose up in me, and God is my witness. I testified about this eight months ago because some of you already know where I'm going, but track with me. i got to put down the framework here. I just felt the Lord say, he can hear you now. And what rose up in me was a boldness, and I started speaking things that I know didn't come from me. I was being a mouthpiece for God because how many know the Lord gave humans dominion over the earth, and when God establishes structure and order, he doesn't send an angel to do it. He sends a person to do it. And so what God was doing was looking for a person to speak to the principality, his word, to enact something upon the earth. So I immediately knew that God was speaking, and I started saying things like this to the principality. You may not know us, but you you will know us now. In the name of Jesus, we will come against you and be a terror to your kingdom. And then I began to speak things prophetically. I said things like, you can bring us to stadiums, we'll fill it with the gospel, or we'll give our lives there like the early Christians. You can put us on blast and let the whole world know about us, but we will not back down and be afraid. Were you there when I testified about this? And within a week, we went out to preach in Logan Square, and what has happened at other times and places happened there, and it was so unique. A guy got about a centimeter from my face, screamed and hollered at me the entire time, knocked down our microphone while we were preaching, and was violent towards me. And when I came home that day, and I testified again that week to the, bro the brothers and sisters, I said, confirmation. The principality hurt us. I've been persecuted like that before, but the way and the viciousness and the level of vitriolic nature and the demonic, let's just be honest, the demonic nature of it, I had not seen in Chicago. I have experienced it in my time in New Orleans on Bourbon Street and other parts of the world, but I had not seen it yet in Chicago, and yet that was not it. We also had people start urinating by us. Grown woman came down and just urinated right while we were preaching. And I started noticing that there was a hostility building up towards us. And I told it to the brothers and sisters, I think this principality is now sending agents against us to be afraid to back down and to lose the ground that the Lord wants to give us in this city. And then it got quiet. And I just thought to myself, well, maybe that was it. A little dust up with the principality and we're done. How many know that was just the introduction? How many know that was just the introduction? Because then what happened was COVID came around, and we simply said after seven weeks, not to be COVID deniers, but we're going to open up our church in responsibility, but in faith to allow God's people begin to, to begin to meet because we believe we're essential. And some of you there were, were there for the very first service. There was no confrontation. I wasn't calling out mayors and governors in a way to try to get attention. I wasn't trying to get on the news. I had just met a person from the news at the place where I launched my boat because he wanted to ask about boat laws and so forth. But all of this was for a up because the moment we launched, we became the face of the church that wanted to kill your grandma because they denied COVID. Insult, persecute, falsely say all kinds of evil against you.
Some of you might remember that during that time, it was actually the Elam Pentecostal Church that then took on the mayor, took on the the government, and went all the way to the Supreme Court with their court case. But it was our face that was even on on their articles. Did you notice that? Like you, my brother, waving the flag was on the cover of their articles, or Jose. And so we were getting more attention than even them, and our entire community uprose against us. Now, thankfully, the only thing they could speak bad about me was the blessings of the Lord that I have a nice house and a boat I've saved up for 20 years. They couldn't find nobody to say I've stolen money or that I've cheated on them or hid on them or took something that didn't belong. But they just kept going. And during that time, this increased. And we went through this, and we had faith in God. And yet, when that stopped... We simply heard about George Floyd and all of these different things, and we just made a statement about it. We said, this is an injustice. This is not right. We are praying for all of these men to be charged, these officers acting as monsters. And we were clear how many saw that, or at least recognized we did that. But then soon came the looting and all of these things. And then we made an even more clear statement that said, here's how we feel about justice. These things should be done. And in the name of justice, these things shouldn't be done. And I still believe in Martin Luther King Jr.'s path to peaceful, nonviolent resistance. I still believe that. I follow it and I teach it. Hence, when we opened up our church in COVID, I didn't go and burn down the stores around me. Because I felt like I was being unjustly persecuted. So we made a statement on that. And yet the world called us racists. Racists. Never been called racist the whole entire time. And people tried to drum up stories against us. And it's like these reporters were dumb on purpose. Did they write about the time we gave away laptops to the schools? Did anybody see that in the news? Did they write about the time we've given away bicycles? That they talk about all the times we have gone and adopted the block at Ohio Park there right off of Cicero in Chicago. Of course not. They took whatever they could use to make us look like we were racist, even though the first church I pastored was all African American. I lived in New Orleans, and I loved the people there, and yet they wanted a narrative. But it didn't stop there. One of our Christian businesses, you know about it, Nini's, gets doxxed. And they ask him, why aren't you saying Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter? And then he takes his time to write a beautiful uh, article, which even included an apology on Instagram. And he says things like, you know, I do believe Black Lives Matter because I believe all lives matter as a Christian. Racism is stupid to me. We're all from one race to human race. But what I can't do is support an organization that has unchristian principles. How did they interpret that? He was a racist. And then they found out that his former life before becoming a Christian, he was a homosexual. And how did they interpret that? That he hated himself and he was homophobic. So all of his old lovers and Boys Town folks started posting up things on Facebook to shame him and defame him. All of these things they had all along, but now they wanted to put him on blast And then they said, well, if he's homophobic and if he's racist, his church must also be racist. Oh, that's the COVID church. Let's get them. And there came the pitchforks and the threats and all of those things. And you've lived through that. But what did Jesus say we were to do? Rejoice and be glad. And in the middle of that, I talked to the Lord and I said, God, when is this principality going to stop messing with us. I feel like you're letting him beat up on me now. I feel like we're in the backyard, Jesus, and you said my son can take on your son, and Lord, he's got me pinned down. If I could just tap out for a minute, Jesus, I feel like it's too much, but I felt the Lord say to me, he didn't believe you when you said it in your prayer closet. He had to test you, and I gave him permission, but he believes you now. He knows what you stand for now, And he is shaking in his boots. I was talking to my wife the other day, and I said, I sense a turning right now. The heavens are open. God is pouring out his spirit. That principality knows he has to loose the city and let it go in Jesus' name. And when I came into this church today, I felt the presence of God like I have not felt in years, if ever before. And I thought that was just good for the first service. But the second service, you elevated it to a whole nother level. God is doing something here. And that principality can't stop it in Jesus' name. God wanted a church and a people that would stand and rejoice. 
and be glad. Are we rejoicing and being glad because we're sadists or we're sick and we're like 50 shades of gray? We take pleasure in being whipped and beaten. No, we're not rejoicing in the whippings and the beatings. Look at it again. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Jesus said those who hold on to their life will lose their life. But those who lose their life for my sake shall find their life. He said, what can a man or a woman give in exchange for their soul? For if you have the whole world and you forfeit your soul, what does it profit you? And I know some of you found us during this time because you might have felt that your church wasn't doing enough or something along those lines. Not everyone has come for that reason, but I'm just saying some of you might have felt during that time your church wasn't doing enough. So you were looking for a church to stand up and do something. But as you were coming in, some of our members were going out to your church because they want to hide. You're saying, I'm done hiding. I'm done being afraid. But they wanted to go be afraid and hide. But I thank God that you're here because I'm praying. Praying for double for my trouble as a pastor. I pray you do what they didn't want to do. I'm not saying we're the only ones, but you know it's easy to find a church to hide in. It's easy to find a church that they're not talking about. It's easy to find a church that's not wanting to hold you accountable to be a disciple. And so as we've seen these things go down in our church, we had people give us resignations on Saturday, and it happened on Friday, and they said, it's partly because of my job and boss. We said, have you even had the official meeting? No, he just said there was a meeting, and I asked, what can I do to resolve it before the meeting? He said, well, I guess if you leave the church, we don't even have to have a meeting. Done. Sent us the resignation Saturday. I'm out the church. People rather quit on, a, quit on Jesus than quit on a job. What was funny is we have a co-worker in the church, worked at the same place, and said, I'll take the meeting. Uh, my church is not racist. We have every ethnic group in the church. As a matter of fact, the white boy pastor is the minority in our church. Yeah, people quit before they even got persecuted. And then we had others suffer because of some uh, people in their community attacked them and make them feel like they were under threat and hurt them and take a phone or others got, got you know, you know uh, threatened online and they're here and yet I had people say, we're afraid that that might even happen so we're out right now. And yet the very people who were having it happen said, I will stand. And when I can't do anything else, I will just stand. And I thank you that you're here today. You're encouraging me because it's showing me that it wasn't just for me. It wasn't just a wrestling with the principality, eating too much pizza, thinking I'm playing spiritual Star Wars now. No, there was a real battle going on for a city and for a nation that God is really wanting us as a body of Christ to stand and to be known for our doctrines and what we believe. And when they do these things to us and we suffer, we rejoice because they did that to the prophets. The prophets were standing on the word of God. They were not preaching their opinions. Jeremiah wasn't just saying what he felt that the Israelites should know. He was being very clear with them. Israel, listen, you have turned from your God. Your leaders have turned from God. That's why we are cursed. And they threw him in a pit. Shut up, Jeremiah. And yet here we are today, standing our ground, believing not just that we're going to be a church that grows a little bit out of this, but a church that sees the 100,000 come forth. Because if this is all the devil can do is roar and make these threats, and we've stood that test, what else does he have left, my friends? Oh, he might kill you and send me to heaven. How do I lose? Some of you might say, well, what about my family? You mean the one who gave you the family you don't trust? He'll take care of your family. I've already told my wife, if anything happens to me, go get a younger version of me and keep on preaching and keep on teaching. Go down to the Bible college and say, who's the radical young man here? I need to find another. <laughs> Woo! Some of y'all think that's crazy, but the missionaries, seriously, read about Victor Plymeyer going to Tibet Losing his family, coming back to the stateside. Who's next? Well, I'll marry you. And he goes right back and he loses his second wife. 
Same thing with these other missionaries in Africa and different places in, in the Central America with Jim Elliott and, and those folks. The men flew down in there and the tribes, people didn't know who they were, why they were there, threw spears at them and killed them. And then the wives said, we're coming next. You can watch that at the end of the spear. The wives came right where their husbands were killed and started a church. But guess what happened when those men were killed by those spears? When they speared them, they saw angels coming, and they had that as a vision. So when the wives came, which was a tradition in their tribes, once you kill the men, you keep the wives. When the wives came, they thought that that meant they were just going to keep them. That's what they get as their spoil and booty now. But what happened was the wives said, what you saw was a sign from our God that you had killed innocent people, but they forgive you, we forgive you. That tribe became saved. The leader of the tribe got saved, and today they're preaching the gospel all over the world. Missionaries now to other places. End of the spear. Watch it. When we give our lives for Jesus, we don't die. We multiply. Let's keep going. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? How many believe the church has lost its saltiness? They look just like the world. They act just like the world. And that's why the world's not bothered by them. There's no heat on it, baby. Are you listening to me? There's no cayenne. There's no fayaya. There's no salsone on it. Are you listening to me? See, baby, I lived in New Orleans. See, I'm going to get real with you. You heard me? It's not just New Orleans. It's New Orleans. And when we cook down there and we eat down there, and I've been certified, by the way, to cook some Cajun food. So if you want it, just let me know. But, but when we cook, we make sure it's spicy. We make sure your nose runs. We make sure you remember what you just had when you go home that night. But you go to Applebee's, Cajun chicken. That's not Cajun. It looks like it. But it's not it. There's a lot of churches that look like they're salty, but they're not salty. There's a lot of churches that put the word on it, but they're not really living by the word. If you can be mature enough, I would like to encourage you to scroll through the Mormon website. Scroll through it. Facebook page. Yes, your pastor gave you permission to check out the Mormons. Tell me what you see different there than what you find on T.D. Jakes, Joe Lostein, and all the rest. I don't believe these people are non-Christians. I do believe Joe Lostein and all these others are Christians. But hear me, I'm saying how they present the message to the world. What is different between them and the Mormons? Go to the Mormon page. Jesus all over there. Pray for you. We love you. Encouraging scriptures. They got their bracelets. They got their, their stuff that they wear, their, their merch. Go to the website, charity, helping people, testimonies. I, since I've come to this church, my life has been changed. I know more about the scriptures. But see, they're not salty with the things of God. And what has happened in our churches, and I'm not the only one saying this. Many, many, many are now saying this. They have lost their saltiness. So look at your neighbor and say, it's time to get salty. Yes, the good kind of salty. It's, kind of get, it's time to get that salzone. It's time to get that, that, that spice up in your life that people know that there's something different about you. He then says, if you lost your saltiness, you're good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot like the salt we use in the winter here. We don't pick that up and then put that in our mouths or put that in our food. It's just good for that purpose to be trampled on. And sadly, the world is using the church now. Let's get some church puppets up here to say what we're saying. Ellen DeGeneres wants somebody to say what she says. She gets a puppet up there to say what she says. They want people to repeat what they're saying. They give them a pass. They give them permission. You can say this, but no further. You can do this, but no further. And then that way we'll respect you. We'll honor you. We'll sell your books here. The Bible says that's good for nothing but to be trampled down. The next example that we're given is that he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. How many know we can't be hidden no more? Even after the COVID thing, when this other thing came up, all the same reporters came after me. Why? Because we can't be hidden. I guarantee you if there's another uprising, they're going to want to know, what's Metro Praise doing? What are those crazy folks doing? Let's go check them out. They're crazy. Don't tell us what's really on their mind. They won't be like Pastor so and so that just shucks and jives. Ask them. They'll tell you. I remember that story about the prophet in the Bible. There was a bunch of prophets around the king, and they just kept saying, King, we love you. Everything is great. God bless you. And one king was hanging out with that king, and he goes, These guys are just your yes men. Is there any other people in your kingdom that actually hear from God? And that king said, Oh, yeah. There's one, 
but he never talks good about me. He never says anything nice about me. And that other king said, go get him, because they were about ready to do a pact together and go to war. I want to hear what that guy says. That prophet came and said, you all know what God says? And they said, yeah, we want to know. And he said, God said, you guys are awesome. Go for it. And the king goes, you're lying to me. Tell me the truth. He said, you're all going to (laughs) die. He said, I told you he never says what I want to hear. I just want to know, is there anybody in your life that can call on you to tell them even what they don't want to hear? Is there anybody here today that's that kind of friend that you're going to tell it as a T.I. is? Is there anybody here that's really going to be that kind of prophetic voice? See, because I believe in Chicago, if they really want to know what God is saying, they're going to say, call on them. They won't tell you what the whole other uh, mayoral, pastoral council says. So you're not supposed to look at yourself as a little small suburb. You're supposed to look at yourself as downtown Chicago lit up for everybody to see. You're not supposed to be hidden. And yet I got my friends as pastors telling me, oh, Joe, if you just did this differently, you could explode the church. Oh, really? What should I do? Well, just don't talk about sin all the time. Do that in small groups on the sneaky sneak. Don't mention the hot topics of abortion or LGBTQ. Don't do any of that. Keep all of that outside of your main event, and then people will come. Well, what about if they find out about those other things? It won't matter because there will be so many others that are already there. I can literally point to you a church right now that lived by that philosophy, and they got blowed up on Google because eventually the homosexuals that were attending said, why won't you marry us? And they didn't go quietly. You look at our Facebook reviews, they know what we believe about homosexuality because now if there's a person who actually wants to be set free from that lifestyle, they know where to go. I had a friend that was going to that church, and uh, he needed some deliverance, and he called us up, and he, and Pastor Bertel is a witness to this, and he said, will you pray a prayer of deliverance? I need to get set free. And we said, well, don't you go to such and such a church? He said, yeah, I still go to that church. They said, uh, Bertel said, why don't you go and ask them to pray prayers of deliverance? Oh, they don't know how to do it like you guys do. So then we said, why don't you come to the church? Oh, you guys are too far. You're too crazy. You're too See, people make excuses. But you know we pay a price for what we love and what we want. A church alive is worth the drive. You, somebody say, I am the light of the world. Say, I'm the light of the world. Say, I am a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Thank you. It says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Some folks, as they were leaving us, they were so spiritual. Somebody say, spiritual. Pastor, pastor, we're not leaving because we're afraid. It just happens to be at the same time we're peeing our pants out of fear that we're leaving, but we're not afraid. The Lord, somebody say the Lord. The Lord hath called us onward. We are going to bring our fire to other locations. No, what you're saying is you're putting your lamp under a bowl. You don't want your lamp out here. You want it under a bowl. It's like that old song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine under a bowl. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. In a church down there where I hide and nobody knows me, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Scared on Facebook, let it shine under a bowl. Let it shine in a church that's whack. Let it shine because I'm a coward and I can't stand up for Jesus. And I think that I, I really can when it counts, but I can't now. I'm getting free. Are you getting free? I'm not bitter. I'm better, but I got to preach to you. Oh, uh, oh, think about it. What does the Bible say? It's still lit. The flame has not gone out, but what do they do with the flame? Hide it under a bushel. Hey, man, I'm a Christian, but I'm not like those guys. I'm not like those guys. I always talk to those people who say that. What do you mean you're not like those guys, like us? What do you mean? Is homosexuality not a sin in your Bible? Is abortion a cool thing to do in your Bible? Like, what do you mean you're not like those guys? Well, we don't talk about it all the time. Well, what are you talking about then? Five ways to live your best life now? Three ways to prosper in this world? I mean, at some point, don't you have to read the commands of the Bible? 
At some point, don't we all have to say it? And so what we hear from the world when we say those commands is that now we're homophobic, that now we're hate mongers, that now we are bigots, but what we really are is Christ followers. We're not here just to be nice, though we may be nice, but this is not Niceanity, brother or sister. This is Christianity, and I've got to tell you the truth even if nobody else does. So I can't take my light and hide it under a bowl even though I know I'm still going to heaven. I'm a Christian. No, I can't take it there. I got to put it up on a stand for everybody to see. Come on. And the Bible says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. They want to mark us just like they do in Islamic nations. When the ISIS or Islamic uh, leaders take over, they mark the Christians' homes as they did with the Jews, marking them. They want to mark you and say, you are an outcast. You can't have a city job. You can't work here. You can't do this because you shine too bright. But the Christian in this world ought not to turn down their flame just to have their job, just to go to the barbecue. Cousin Flacco didn't like you anyways. Are you listening? I got pe- I'm serious. I got people leaving the church because Cousin Flacco don't like them anymore. Cousin Flacco never liked you. People leave the church because baby mama don't like you anymore. Baby mama never really liked you anyway. Some of you are so concerned about shining your light in front of these people, and they don't care about you anyways. Let that light shine. I'm not talking about being mean and rude and then calling that persecution. Some crazy preachers took a pig's head and went to an Islamic festival, and then when they got beat on and and spit at, they said, we're suffering for Jesus. No, you're suffering because you're dumb. That would be the equivalent of me wearing a cub shirt to a Sox game. You're not suffering because of religious reasons. You're just inciting a riot. But you see, Christians are being told to go back into the closet as they have come out the closet. We didn't come to to start a riot. We just came to stand our ground. Can I hear an amen to them? How many know that if they call Jesus' names, the apostles' names, they're going to call you names? Do you believe that? How many are going to, in those times, rejoice and be glad? Can I hear an amen? Let's look at what they called our Jesus, our precious Lord and Savior. Here are the scriptures. They called him a glutton, a drunkard, and a friend or an associate of sinners, low lives, tax collectors. When John the Baptist came, he came fasting, wearing weird clothes and eating locusts, and they said, you are weird, John. We think you're demon-possessed. But when Jesus came, he's turning water into wine, giving them all the fish they can eat, healing the sick. And then they say, he's a drunkard, a glutton, and he's a friend of prostitutes and sinners. There's one right there washing his feet. Now, let's be honest. Does this get you to change your view about Jesus because people thought that about him? Do you need to go hear the other side? Well, I'm just going to take time to figure it out and hear the other side. There's nothing wrong with taking time to find out what the truth is. I mean, please don't believe everything I say. Test it. But how many know you just get to a point where that just becomes an excuse? I don't need to talk to the Pharisees of Jesus' day to know they're lying about Jesus. The closest people to Jesus knew who he was and knew what he stood for. The closest people in our lives should know who we are and know what we stand for. But that's what they said about Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And how many know you don't crucify somebody you love? But if today Jesus was standing in front of Nini's Deli, preaching about marriage being the only acceptable sexuality, according to his father, if Jesus was talking about life being in the womb and how John the Baptist got so excited when his preborn self met the preborn self of Jesus, how many know that story is pretty awesome? Jesus would be talking about preborn rights of humans. How many know that if they heard Jesus saying that today, they would say to Jesus, Jesus, you belong. Right here. And crucify him again. And say, stay there and know your place. Stay there and know your place, Jesus. You're just a drunkard anyway. We heard you hang out with prostitutes. Isn't it something how the irreligious always try to put down the religious? It's like, when did you become an expert on drinking gluttony and having, being around prostitutes? And yet they put down Jesus. You're just garbage. We don't need you. Why? Because he was speaking to their hearts. 
And when the heart is convicted, they come after you to defend your, themselves. I mean, haven't you been there before? You feel attacked. You feel like you're better than what people are saying about you. You try to attack the other person instead of looking inward to find if that is actually true. That's why so often when we talk to married people who are considering divorce, it's all because of the communication breakdown, and they're not speaking words of life or learning from each other, and they're just pointing fingers. We're in a healthy marriage. You grow together. Love is grown, and it's pruned, and it's shaped over time. And yet sinners, because they don't honor the things of God, instead of looking inwardly going, Uh, Maybe with what we know about science and everything, that is a person, and we shouldn't kill it. Instead of doing that, in the name of tolerance, they'll flick us off, cuss us out, and threaten to kill us while we're preaching pro-life. In their mind, it makes sense for them to defend murder by wanting to murder us, and they then call us the hate mongers. When we want to spare the child from being murdered, life, check mark, and we don't want to murder them. We don't cuss them out. And yet they seem justified in their anger because we're dealing with people who are irrational. Imagine being so irrational that you think Jesus is demon-possessed. That's what they said about him. You're doing miracles. It's spooky. It's freaking us out. Instead of attributing it to the Father and then taking Jesus serious, they go, dude, you must be demon-possessed. Imagine calling Jesus demon-possessed. How many know that would be crazy? And yet they did it. Why? Because this is what they thought. Everybody get this. If what you are representing as God is your version, it is so different to my version that what you're calling God must be the devil i got to say it again. The reason why they call Jesus demon-possessed is that what he was describing as the Father was so different than what they thought the Father was like that they said, you're not representing the Father. You're representing the devil. They had been that deceived. Think about it. People think when we represent morality from the Bible that we're actually representing the devil, that we're hateful. And that we're so off. But what is the problem? Is that their understanding is broken. Instead of them admitting it at Jesus' time and even in our time, maybe I don't know anything about God. Uh, Maybe I don't know about the devil. Maybe I'm actually being deceived because the one doing miracles is telling me I'm deceived. Maybe I should listen to this person and lower my ideas down and accept his. Instead of doing that, demon possessed. Instead of them reasoning, using rationality, they just scream back at us just like they did to Jesus. And then lastly, they said, you're going to destroy the temple. You're a troublemaker. Jesus, the troublemaker? No. Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it because he was talking about his body. And then because, everybody get this, because they crucified him, the judgment came on the temple. In other words, the very thing that they feared came upon them because they came under God's judgment. In actuality, we want the best for America. But if America keeps putting us down thinking we're trying to harm them, God's judgment will come upon them and harm them, and they'll lose everything they value. So instead of them making their worst fears come true by persecuting us, they need to actually accept the message we're saying so that this temple, so that the city may be spared. Does anybody get that today? Let's look at what they called Paul. How many think Paul is pretty awesome? Amen. Look at the book of Acts and see what they called Paul, the one who wrote three-fourths of the New Testament, a troublemaker, a lawbreaker, a babbler. They literally said of our apostle Paul, the most scholarly theologian of the New Testament, who today, people who study the Greek language will study his writings to understand the depth of his knowledge and his information. He is the most widely read theologian in the entire world. The apostle Paul, when the Greek philosophers heard him, they said, babbler, look at the babbler, he's babbling. And they laughed at him and shut down down one of his talks due to their riotous mockery. Listening to the greatest theologian called him a babbler, a lawbreaker, a troublemaker. 
When one king listened to him describe how Jesus was the Messiah, they literally thought Paul was like the guy wearing the tinfoil hat in his basement with a cork board and thumb uh, pins with yarn connecting the dots all crazy and conspiratorial. They said, Paul, you're out of your mind. You are insane. And literally, what is Paul doing? Christ was in the Old Testament. Christ was prophesied here. When Christ came upon the earth, he did these things. It's written about him. And instead of them humbling themselves, they said, Paul, you're out of your mind. Why? Because their mind had no room for Jesus. Then, and kind of like Paul's diary, he describes what people are saying about him versus all of the quote-unquote Christians of his time. You can read it for yourselves in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, you guys, a part of this Christianity that you're doing, you're considered the best people on the planet. But I'm a spectacle to the universe. You are so wise. Everybody buys your books and listens to you. But I am a fool for Christ. You guys are so strong when you preach to your big crowds and have everybody amen, but I'm weak because I don't know if I'm going to make it to the church today to preach. They might stone me. You're honored. Rome brings you in and sits you at the head of the table. I'm dishonored. You are considered the gems and the jewels, the precious metals of the earth, but I'm the scum of the earth. You are considered the treasure of your culture. Everyone listens to you, puts you on CNN and all the talk shows, and yet I, Paul said, am considered to be the garbage of the world. How in the world did the very people Paul had once pastored live on a totally different island than him? Worlds apart. These were his very own people. Well, I don't see it would take much time, and I've even seen it in a congregation like mine. There was a point when we had to leave. We left with the Riascos because I thought my life was under threat as the Riascos were, and out of your safety, I didn't want to be here. So like the book of Acts says, the apostles moved on and the church continued. We were willing to do that. And the place I was choosing just happened to be really sunny and nice, Tampa, Florida. And God said, there ain't no Metro Praise going to Tampa, Florida. You're going back to Chicago because this is not for you to go. Those families need to go. And thank you for bringing them this far, but turn right back around and go home. And I drove all night right back home. And the riot police met us out there, and they said, burn that place down. There was 12 of us in here, and we preached, and everything's been good ever since. I love being home, sweet home Chicago. But I just want to be honest with you. I was willing to do that apostolic move, but God said, no, you ain't doing it like that. You're not so big for your britches right now. They ain't coming to kill you. Just relax. They had put my home address out as well as they were making threats, but God told me to come back. So as I came back, the Lord spoke to me, and he began to put this in perspective for me to understand that what we consider honor in the world is really what the world considers dishonor. You see, Paul said it oftentimes, you guys are ashamed of my chains. You guys are embarrassed. So let's just put myself in those shoes. Let's say it actually was a God thing for me to go away for six months. Berto and Griselda continue to pastor their church, or one of the pastors you've seen here today. Didn't they do a great job? And the church continues, because what if I would have died that day? The church would have still continued, unless you all just would have been cowards going, I guess the church is over. <laughs> Metro praise is done, guys. Pastor's dead. We out of here. Okay, but watch, watch. Let's say I'm gone. I'm with the families that were being threatened unto death, and it was good for us to go. It's not always good to go, but I'm just saying in this situation, you're still here, you're going to church, and after a while, maybe the pastors or the leaders start to say, Joe was pretty crazy, wasn't he? We probably don't got to preach on the streets anymore. Let's just hold back on that. Let's just say you go, yeah, that's wisdom, wisdom. A lot of people do a lot of uninspiring, uh, lacking of faith things and calling it wisdom. Anyways, uh, was it wise to walk on water with Jesus? Was it wise to face the Red Sea? Was it, I can be here all day. Are you listening? So out of wisdom and just doing everything in excellence, we're going to stop preaching on the streets, and maybe, maybe you go along with it. And you know what? We're going to edit 
some of our sermons, and we're going to make sure we don't preach against homosexuality and all of that. Now imagine, about six months go by, and I come back to the church, and you guys host me here. And like, Pastor Joe's back, here he is. And then I start preaching, and then you get offended. Joe, we don't preach like that anymore. Remember what happened when you did last time? Joe, we don't do that anymore. Joe, that's so embarrassing. So embarrassing, Joe. We don't do that. That's what happened. The church turned against their leadership because they wanted a different path. And Jesus was very clear that the path to heaven is narrow and few find it. We're believing for 100,000, but how many know that's few out of 8 million in greater Chicagoland? And few find it. And we're not supposed to walk around with the martyr syndrome, but we are supposed to walk around being real about this, that yes, there's going to come a cost. And I'll tell another story here, honest truth. If I said this gentleman's name, most of you in this city would know him and honor him. He's a great preacher. I look up to him. I would consider him a great man of God. We were in New Orleans where our Bible college has an annual conference. Like I said, I pastored there, and now I have our school with us here from that same Bible college. But we go back to New Orleans once a year. We were out there, and this pastor wanted to start one of the extension sites in his church. So I took him with me, and I said, let me show you around. You know, as you're hearing about the school, let's go out and do ministry now. So we go down to Bourbon Street. Bourbon Street is kind of like what you've seen on our streets, except for the fires. It's mayhem, and it's crazy out there, okay? So we go out there, and I go, brother, we're going to preach. Are you ready? His eyes got as big as saucers. Oh, preach! Preach! And then he literally said this to me. I know you're having fun with this. He literally said this to me. What am I going to preach about? Why? Because he was used to going to his church, standing behind a pulpit with all of his people, getting sister so-and-so fired up and brother so-and-so, having his organist or his you know, worship band. He had it down to a science. But now that he was out in the public like Jesus and the disciples and how the apostles were, he didn't know where to start. God is my witness, because I, I love him and I love pastors. I said, brother, just talk about Jesus, heaven and hell, the gospel, and that God can change people's lives. And when I handed him the mic, you could tell he started with fear. His voice was cracking. He didn't feel comfortable. But within a few moments, the preacher came out. And I'm like, Atta boy, that's my man. I said, now you know what real preaching's like. Anybody can preach behind a nice pristine pulpit to all the pretty people in the pews. But it takes a man or woman of God with a prophetic unction to go out to a place where nobody likes you, wants to hear from you. And you say, thus says the Lord. That's where you get to see what God has for us. Sometimes they say, well, don't be so heavenly minded. You won't be any of, er of no earthly good. I want to be so heavenly minded that I change the earth for good. I want to raise up a church that sees the kingdom of God go against the gates of hell and win. How many want to see disciples made of the nations? How many want to be that, that what we've heard of so often, generation shakers, roof breakers, come on, history makers? Well, to do it, you've got to be willing to be called these things. And let's take it out of our context, just in your context, as what we've seen even as pastors. We've had people in this church say, my Catholic family doesn't want to come to my baptism. Why? Well, because they say, I was baptized as a child, and everyone in our family is Catholic, and by you getting rebaptized, you're dishonoring the family of Wayla, Grandma, Grandpa. We're not coming. We've had that. We've had others like come from the LGBT community and all of their friends and family say, we loved you and accepted you like that. We will not accept you like this. And then they'll ask them, did they do conversion therapy? And we tell them, no, it was Jesus, not therapy, it was Jesus. And then what they'll hear back is, so it was conversion therapy. Listen, the same thing that changes the person from homosexuality to living as the one that God created him to be is the same power that changes the alcoholic into somebody sober-minded. It's the same one that takes the cheating husband and brings him back home. It's the same one that takes the thief and has them steal no more. Can I get an amen? It's the power of God. If you want counseling, that's awesome, but we do not predicate the power of God here based on counseling. It has its time and place, but we don't do it. We don't hook you up to an electric 
electrocuting machine and then, you know, ask you if you're a homosexual, does this man in a G-string turn you on? And then if your heart starts to beat, we start zipping and zapping you. No, we don't do that to the adulterer. We don't do that to the thief. We don't do that to the drunkard. It's one step to Jesus Christ. And he, whoever is a new creation in Christ, the new has come and the old has gone. We believe that we're saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. But in the process of living as a Christian, they'll call you a babbler out your mind, insane. You're a spectacle. You know you're embarrassing the family. It's not just a church thing, is it? It really isn't. Let's be honest. I'm looking across to people right now that have lost relationships. You have asked me to pray with you, some with your very own parents, because you have chosen to serve God. Can I encourage you today to rejoice? Somebody say rejoice. This is what they'll call you. I've mentioned them throughout our service. Racist, bigot, hate monger, homophobic, Islamophobic, cult, brainwash. How many have been called that before because you believe in what Jesus believes? Hey, I'll save you time. Just call me a Christian. Just call me a Christian. I'm one of them. Yes, I'm one of them, but I'm not a racist. There's only one race, the human race. I'm not a bigot. I love everybody. I'm not a hate monger. I even forgive my enemies. Can you do that? I'm not homophobic. I'll invite you in my house and pray for you and love on you and share a meal with you. I'm not Islamic phobic. I just want you to see you repent of that demonic religion and get the real God, okay? And here today, I'm not a cult. I'm following Christ, and I'm not brainwashing the way you think, but I have been washed by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen? That, so we're going to turn it on them and show them the truth. Now let's go to Jesus. Turn with me in uh, John chapter 15, verse 18, as the band comes. What did Jesus say? He said, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. Christians have been hated for a long time, haven't they? And we have to understand in our culture, Christianity is now being hated. I remember putting up a post that said, if I did this wrong, you know, and how we preach to BLM and all that, forgive us. It's still up, as I mentioned before. But I asked them very clearly, am I still a bigot according to you because I still think LGBT is a sin? And they said yes. So there's really no way around it in their worldview, is there? And then they said, you owe Planned Parenthood an apology. No. I said, you guys want to defund the police. I want to defund Planned Parenthood. Right. Come on, somebody. Come on. If you belong to the world, if you were in Oprah's book club reading what she reads, the world would love you as its own. Come on, how many know if we just did the experiment right now, if we just did the experiment, we put on the rainbow color flags, hang out at Boys Town, and affirm everything going on there, they love us. How many know we come out there with the Chicago for Jesus and we preach, they're going to hate us? Does that now mean we hate them? Absolutely not. The first five years I was in Chicago, I went to Boys Town every Friday and Saturday, going back to that word about the principality. That's why I told you I've never experienced that much hate. And that was even from a straight dude that looked just like me. His name was probably Johnny. Johnny, oh, Johnny over there was screaming at me. Why? Because I had provoked something in the spiritual realm. And God said, I got you, son. So yeah, they play by their standard. We don't play that way. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God so loved Boys Town. God so loved the Crips, the Bloods, the G's. God so loved Trump, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden. God so loved the world. God so loved the Muslim. God so loved the Hindu. God so loved everybody. We don't play by those rules. We don't just love our own. We don't just love our own. We love everyone. Isn't that something how they couldn't find these clips to put on the news? When I met with Dr. Brown on the radio show, and he talked about how we were being persecuted. He's, and I told him, I said, pray for some of our families and people in the church. They're getting so afraid right now. He said, afraid. Go back and listen to it. He said, afraid. They should be coming with five friends from the neighborhood and say, this is a real church that's on fire for Jesus. And I'm so glad to see you doing that here today. Because that's how we show the world we're not backing down. And when it's their time, they'll know who to call. That's why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. Okay, Jesus, we're going to remember. I need to remember today. A servant 
is not greater than their master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours. That's why we can't be more Christian than Christ-like. Like, man, if they hated Jesus, they're going to hate me. How can I get around that? I don't walk around with a chip on my shoulder, but I get it like the most loving person in the whole world. They hate it because of his message. And I know I can be the most loving person in the world, and they'll still hate me. One of my close friends, she was a deacon in the church. Her husband did not serve the Lord. He does now, thankfully. But he once did, but the time she was here, he did not. I said, sister, why doesn't your husband come? What's going on? She said, oh, Joe, it's a sad story. I said, tell me. She said, we were a part of a great ministry that helped the homeless. We would bring them in even to our house. And my husband has such a tender heart. And one relationship he had with the homeless man was so close. He felt like this guy was a brother. That everything he was doing for him was kind of like one of those situations where it's like, you make it worth it, man. I'm glad I'm doing this for you, man. You know, It was touching to this guy, her husband. But the homeless man went back to his life of drugs and alcohol. And like the devil, he couldn't just mess with that dude. Now the guy turning to drugs points his finger at her husband and goes, It's your fault. You weren't a good leader. Man, the guy brought him into his house, let him wear his clothes, got him a job. I mean, come on, what more could he have done other than breastfed him? But you, you, you weren't there. You let me down. And spoke so much death over him that that man said, If this is what it's like to serve God, I quit. Why? Because he was doing it for someone other than Jesus. Because guess what Jesus was still saying as that guy was going back to drugs? Jesus was saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. You loved him even when he didn't love you. You helped him when he didn't want to be helped. You gave him your, your best when he didn't want it. You're just like me, son. Well done. So my friends, don't get discouraged when they treat you like they treat your master. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours. They treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. How many can say your friends, your family, your Facebook friends, anybody within an earshot of you has no excuse for sin anymore? Come on. If I was to die today, at least we can say, man, look, you have no excuse for what you do anymore. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. That's why when we talk to other religions, we're not trying to be mean. We're just saying Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. Oh, but we got Muhammad. No, you really hate God then. How can you say that I love God, I love Allah, I love, no, no, no. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have the God of the Bible. We're not saying that because we hate you. We're saying that because we love you. And if you turn against this message, you're turning against the Father. He said, if I, now this is specific to Jesus. Nobody can say this but Jesus. All that was to us. Now this is about him. He says, if I had not done among them the works no one else did, these are the works of the Messiah no one else could do, they would not be guilty of sin. Now he's talking about the whole people group of the uh, rejecting Jewish folks. He says, as it is, they have seen, yet they have hated both me and my father. And of course, they kept saying, we love God, we love God. But he said, no, no, no. If you don't accept me, you're really hating, according to the scriptures. But this was to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. And this is where we can come and pull this back to us. How many of you have been hated without reason? Let's pray as the altar workers come. Father.